Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone. If you're feeling regular, you're in the right place. Let's roll. We'll start with one sent by Rob who wrote, In December, I purchased a couple lots from a local online auction house. 15 1983 Lawrence Taylors in near mint plus condition and 45 1985 Steve McMichael rookie cards in X mint condition. My son helped me pick out five cards from the lots that were worthy of grading. After seller and grading fees, I was in all in for right around $300 total. I was stunned when the grades came back. Uh, the boy was four for four with the Steve McMichaels he told me to grade, with three getting sevens and one getting an eight. But the real shocker was that the LT received a 10. I didn't think it was possible for a 41 year old card to receive a 10 from PSA. There was no direct comps for its value, but a 1983 Joe Montana Record Breakers subset card had similar sale prices as the LT for PSA 9s and 8s, and a 10 for that card recently sold for 500 It's rather amazing as raw versions of the card, even in apparently near mint plus condition, rarely sell for more than a few bucks. Using the Montana PSA 10 as a comp, I listed the tailor for 600 just to see if I would receive any offers. Sure enough, I almost immediately received an offer of $450 and quickly accepted. Meanwhile, the demand for the McMichaels cards have skyrocketed due to his induction into the Hall of Fame, and I figure I can sell the four graded McMichaels for about $500 total. I already sold all the others raw, clearing about $300 total for them before fees. In the end, I figure to quadruple my total investment on these lots just two months after purchase. This one sent by Michael wrote, check this out, trying to pass this off as a legit card by saying in the 87 Fleer style, uh, poor buyer is going to be out $50. And yeah, this is a fake card, no question about it. There, this is not a legit card, I've never seen it before. And it's unlicensed, obviously, and whoever made this in their garage was just trying to make it look like the uh, 87 Fleer baseball style. And yeah, 46 bucks is what it went for in auction. Um, you know, if the buyer happens to see this, feel free to get a full refund as you're not allowed to sell cards like this on eBay. I, you can, but you have to declare them fake or unlicensed or whatever, reprints. Uh, the seller has not done that here. You know, you certainly can't use words like 1987 and Fleer, Retro, Rookie, XRC. The, these words do not apply to a fake card. You could, If you wrote here, you know, Ken Griffey Jr. fake card or Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, you know, homemade card, I guess that might be okay. But uh, all these other words, definitely not okay. And yeah, in the 87 Fleer style, is, you know, adding to the uh, misleading, as you mentioned. Next one was sent by James, wrote, I regularly go to shows and buy sell cards, as you probably do, to make a bit of money and allow the hobby to fund itself. Recently, I was surprised to find this 2000 Mario Lemieux Chrome Rookie Reprint Refractor in a value bin for just $15. I was planning on keeping this as a PC card and sending it to PSA, but when I shared the card on social media, I received an offer from a local buyer for $500. As the Million Dollar Man would say, everybody has a price. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't know this until kind of recently. A lot of these reprints from right around, you know, late 90s, really early 2000s from Topps uh, are, are not worth very much. No, you know, Nolan Ryan and Mickey Mantle and Johnny Unitas and a couple others. Uh, even the refractors are not worth a whole lot, like 10, 20, you know, 30 bucks maybe at the most. But for some reason, the Mario Lemieux refractors are really, really valuable. And obviously you got a, a total steal here. Congrats. Next one sent by Tom, or what I was browsing through recently listed cards, and this caught my eye. I pressed buy it now before I really had a chance to pause and think. The reason that I did this was because I saw that it had uh, gold instead of silver embossing on the bottom, which means it was actually the much rarer parallel out of 50. I think the seller must have copied the title from another listing because the number is clearly visible on the back. Yeah, you can see in the listing here they said it's out of 1,000, but yeah, on the back it's clearly out of 50 at the top there. And yeah, this was a total steal at, at, at 10 bucks. Uh, any card from the 90s numbered out of 50 is going to be a great buy at, at 10 bucks. but this is a Hall of Famer, Roy Holiday, and a you know, third-year card or something like that, so you got a, uh, got a total bargain here for, for 10 bucks. Next one was sent by Graham Hurt. We all know and love the famous Billy Ripken F-Face card, but not sure I've ever seen a 100-count lot. I got outbid by $100. The interesting thing is the buyer got them for $3.25 per card, which is essentially what the black box variation sells for as a single if the goals break up value, I'm not sure this was the best buy. Could be wrong, or the buyer could be planning something else with them. The opportunities are endless. Also a bit tough is there's only one photo, and you can't truly tell the condition of the cards, which rules out buying and grading in my mind. Uh, regardless, a fun one for sure. Yeah, and for those who, aren't, who don't know, the 1989 Fleer Billy Ripken is, you know, the most famous error ever, probably. There's something written on the bat, bat knob that shouldn't be there. But this is the corrected version, where they put a black box over it so you couldn't see it anymore. And this card is very, very common. It's a... Uh, Junk Wax Era card, 1989 Fleer, and this is not rare at all. There's lots of them, and, you know, here's proof. There's a 100-count lot here on eBay. Uh, but still, you know, it, give, despite it being a common, it sells for a couple dollars because of the uh, the error aspect to it. But, 
Yeah, three hundred twenty-five dollars for a hundred count lot. That does seem very, very high uh, because, like you said, you can you can find these for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars a piece pretty regularly. So you know, I don't know. I'm not sure what the the buyer's intention is here. Maybe just thought that would be you know fun to have so many all at once. This was sent in by Ronald, who wrote, Not sure if this has come into your sites before. I've seen this listing multiple times, often reflecting an image of various high-end cards. The image below is for an autographed Upper Deck uh, Griffey rookie. I have seen the image also displayed as a 1952 Mantle or a 41 DiMaggio, but the main listing is always the same. Guaranteed baseball rookie card, with the image uh, being a high-value card and a price listed between $5 and $20. Only when you read the description will you find that what you are purchasing is actually guaranteed to be a rookie card of a baseball player. You really don't even know who they will send you. This seems downright criminal. Uh, what your, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't stand this stuff. Uh, I mean, it's very very manipulative, obviously, putting a card. There's no chance anyone's going to be sent this 89 Upper Deck Griffey Auto or this 52 Mantle PSA 6, which is also in the listing. That's a six-figure card. No chance that's getting sent on a you know a $10, $15 purchase. You're going to probably be getting a card worth a buck that the seller is just trying to get rid of. And scamming someone for fifteen dollars. Now, I mean, if you if you buy this, you know, you're a bit of a sucker. I, I'll acknowledge that, but still, I just don't like this from the seller at all. And yeah, the 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 uh, they're sort of banking on the fact that somebody's going to just look at the photo, think there's a getting a great bargain, not bother reading the description, and overpaying for you know a card that probably is otherwise unsellable. Next one sent by Tom. I ran across this 1961 top Stan Musial PSA four that had a starting bid of twenty nine dollars and forty five cents with one day left to go in the bidding, with no bids. Uh, I was wondering if it's a red flag. Ignoring the possible red flags, I set up a, Gix a Gixson's night to bid just uh, just over the opening bid price, and I got it. Notice that it, I did not say that I won it. That's the point. I'm not sure if I won or I lost. Uh, example, everyone says buy the card, not the grade. Outside the fact that this card is significantly off-centered, both left and right and top to bottom, it otherwise seems to be pretty legitimate PSA 4, but being, PS uh, being OC is an issue, right? So I invite your thoughts on me being all in on this purchase for 3764 I'm going to have trouble breaking even here, or or am I going to have trouble breaking even here, or can I expect to make some money? If so, what's your best guess on a fair asking price? Uh, no, everything looks legit here. This is a 1961 top Stan Musial PSA 4. I don't see anything fishy about anything. The center, yeah, it's off-centered in both directions, but but well within the, the guidelines of a PSA 4. And, I mean, you know, a PSA 4 looks like a reasonable grade uh, on the surface here, just looking at the cards front and the back. So I think... I think this is probably a fair listing. You got it for thirty dollars. You said thirty-seven ish with uh, shipping and tax and stuff. And yeah, that's basically market value. PSA four copies of this card generally sell around uh, thirty-five to forty. So you basically bought it for for market value. Here's a nice story. This was sent by John, who wrote, "I recently came across some interesting items while card trading with my local card shop owner. To trade, I brought several vintage Brooks Robinson cards. He was my favorite player, the Human Vacuum Cleaner." After going through my uh, Brooks stuff after his death last year, I found many duplicates, some early 60s and 70s. I also included some early Mike Schmidt, Boog Pal, and Ozzy Smiths. My card shop guy recently acquired a vintage collection, still uh, stored in a cigar box. Going through them, I found many nice cards, uh, 55 Bowman, 63 Tops, 62 Tops, and some 60s Post. So I traded my stuff. I got a 55 Bowman, Sal Magley, Johnny Padres, a 62 Richie Ashburn, Ron Santo, Robin Roberts, 62 Mantle in Action, 63 Post, and a 55... Uh, tops doubleheader Jackie Robinson. I also found something cool in the cigar box that made me think about the hobby. Amongst the Tops and Bowman cards were several cards that at a quick glance looked like 1940s leaf, but they weren't. They were homemade cards, which I feel are vintage as well. So I took those cards too. Uh, my favorite from the trade, the homemade cards for sure. I pictured some kid, maybe too poor to afford cards, but who found a way to make his own. It gave me a warm feeling, made me think about the hobby in a positive way. I tend to disparage the hobby most times, astounded by the prices for cards of players who hadn't done anything career-wise to warrant that sort of price. I've been sad about Brooks's passing, but those homemade cards really lifted my spirits. So R.I.P. Brooks Robinson and hats off to the kid with the scissors, glue, and an ink pen. This one sent by Dave. Wrote, uh, this was my listing on eBay. I listed the card for $400 or best offer, which I thought was high for the card since recent sales of a PSA 9 and a Beckett 8.5 were both under $250. I got an offer about an hour after I listed it for 360 I figured I'd let it sit until the next day, then right before going to sleep, it was purchased at my list price. I found this card in a 5k box at my LCS and it had a $10 price tag on it. I thought I'd, uh, I, took, I brought it to the counter and the worker asked for only $5. I do not understand why this card would be worth this much. It's not numbered and it's not even autographed by Jeter. Uh, what are your thoughts? I'm using the money from the sale of this card and putting it towards my daughter's sixth birthday. Uh, very cool to hear about your, your daughter and, and, uh, and her birthday. That's a uh, a nice, nice, nice touch there at the end. Happy to hear that. But I'm actually not familiar with this card, and I would have not have thought that this was a super valuable card. 
I mean, it's you know pretty cool. It's got, a, I guess, a, a token from the subway uh, during during the the subway series, the Yankees against the Mets. I guess is what's going on here. So uh, it's I, I assume it's very very rare. I've never even seen it before. So that does suggest that it's quite rare. And obviously, you know, someone's willing to pay four hundred dollars for it. So that you know also suggests that it's quite rare. So congrats on your you know five dollar purchase here with a uh, what would that be eighty x ROI. And we'll finish on this one. This sent by Grant, who wrote, I recently purchased this 1992 Proline Portress Lin Swan autograph. As you know, these were the, among the first pack-inserted autographs. The signed versions did not have a number in the bottom right-hand corner on, on the back, and they were also embossed. All the cards were signed on the back. Lin Swan is a Hall of Fame receiver for the Steelers. His career started in 1974, and he played until 1982. What makes this card special is Lin Swan is a tough autograph, and he refuses to sign cards. Even at shows, he refuses to sign any cards. His rookie card is 1975 tops, and he has 76 and 77 tops cards, but does not appear in, in a major set again during his playing days. The story is that he feels like he was not compensated by card companies and thus refuses to sign cards to this very day. His 1975 tops rookie has 15 signed copies on the PSA Pop Report. His last pack inserted autographs were in, and were in 2008, and there were less than 50 of those. In 2003 and 4, he signed about 400 cards for Donruss and Upper Deck. The 1992 Pro-Line portraits are his most attainable autograph. There have been two sales in 2024, one for 260 and one for 170. This seller had a copy at 200 or best offer, and I offered 100 to start the negotiation. The seller accepted this $100 offer. This card currently has a pop three at SGC and none graded by PSA. Normally, I would submit this to SGC as they did not charge for autographs before 1997, but with no copies at PSA, I will probably pay up and have the only card in a PSA holder. But that's it for this week's regular rollers. Hope everyone enjoyed. Hope you're all eating your vegetables. May the force be with you. And whether you're high or regular, keep on rolling. Thanks, everyone.